verses 17 through 21, if you would please. Chapter 5, verses 17 through 21. And just a reminder, if, you're, if you are reading uh, or speaking, please make sure that the microphone's on and pointed in your general direction. Go ahead, you can read it. So then, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is, and do not get drunk with wine, that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. All right. So last week we ended off with a discussion of what the will of the Lord is. Um, and that was, that was question number 6A. What is the will of the Lord? And it's, it's a very broad question, I realize. Um, but we took a little bit of time and went through several, several different verses to find out that really the will of God ultimately is we know Him. That we, we learn of Him, that we have a relationship with Him, that we draw closer to Him. Um, and so we had several, several verses related to that. I'm going to read those just the references again in case you don't have those written down. Uh, but 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 3. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3. And 1 Thessalonians 5, 18. Are two good examples that specifically say, for this is the will of God for you. Um, 2 Peter 3, 9 is another one. 2 Peter 3, 9. Um, and then I, I gave you a couple of general um, verses in Hebrews 5.14. Hebrews 5.14. And Philippians 1, 9 through 11. Okay. Philippians 1, 9 through 11. So in, in case you didn't get those last week, I want to make sure that you get those because, I mean, that that's a big question. That's a big item and issue. Yes, ma'am. I also have 2 Timothy 2, 24 to 26. 2 Timothy 2, 24 to 26. Yeah, it's written in purple, so that came up on oh. Wednesday. Oh, that could have been me. I think that was the one that you had mentioned. Well, that might be the one we were talking back and forth. Okay. Yeah, I don't think it's with you. Yes, that's It's on the other item. Right. On, on the other one? <laughs> the other item. Okay. How do you do? Nothing. <laughs> All right, so those, those are some uh, verses connected with this idea of what is the will of God. Um, and I, I think that it's important because if you start looking for that, that phrase and that idea of doing the will of the Father, doing the will of God, that's what we are to be about. That's a, a, a thing that ought to um, kind of define our lives and the way that we handle things in the way that we, we go through life. So um, we, we took a bit of time to kind of delve into that one and deal with it. Uh, but then we get to verse 18. And that kind of gets into some more, uh, I'm going to call it specifics of how are we then to not be foolish, but understand the will of the Lord. And, and that is a, a contrast, just like we've been seeing contrasts over and over in Ephesians. We're not to be foolish, but instead understand certain things. And we're going to have another contrast in verse 18. And there are two commands that are listed there. What are they? Not get drunk. Do not get drunk. That's number one. Okay? And then how's, what's that contrasted with? Be filled with the Spirit. Be filled spirit. with the Spirit. The spirit. So, um, I, I think there's a lot going on in this to, to be aware of. Now, is Paul's primary focus, is his primary goal to discuss alcohol? I don't think so. He is, he is giving a command and an instruction. Don't be drunk. And I think we can take that one to the bank. So don't, don't misunderstand anything else. We aren't to be drunk. But his focus, his goal is to present this contrast or this distinction, this difference, so that we understand a comparison 
like we've seen before of we were dead, but now we're alive. We were foolish, but now we understand. We, you know, past and, and present situations, that contrast comes up. So I think that we, we do need to keep that in mind. He says, do not get drunk with wine. Does that mean I can get drunk with something else? No. No. Again, that's not the point. That's not what he's emphasizing. He's saying, don't be drunk because that gives us an example specifically for that is dissipation. Well, what is dissipation? Falling into evil actions. Evil actions, okay. Wastefulness. Wastefulness. Reckless living. Reckless living. Uh, it is, uh, yeah, G810, dissipation, uh, riot, excess, waste. I wrote down pointlessness of no value. Uh, the words used in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 4, if someone wants to get there and read it for us. 1 Peter 4, 4. In all this, they are surprised that you do not run with them in the same excesses of debauchery, and they slander you. Okay. Uh, debauchery or dissipation, it's that same word there. And, and Peter is presenting this, this distinction, and that the people who are still in the world and of the world, they're surprised that we don't do that kind of a thing. Um, that we don't live in a way that is in excess of dissipation or debauchery, and they make fun of us for that. What uh, this this word also does come up a couple other places in in scripture, but the the point or the idea is that we are not to be doing that. We're not to be drunk. That's worthless. It's pointless. It adds no value. Well, what are we supposed to be doing? What's the context of this whole? whole section that we've been dealing with. I've talked about redeeming the time. Okay, redeeming the time. Doing things that are of value and that are, are useful. Um, things that accomplish the will of God. Specifically in verse 15 it says, Be careful how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. Redeeming or making the most of the time. So if you're, if you're going, getting drunk all the time, you're wasting the opportunities, you're wasting the value, you're wasting your life. Really, instead, he gives us a contrast. And what is that contrast? Be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. Now, um, there's, there is a little bit of, of debate and discussion about how that phrase fits with what it, everything that comes afterwards. And if you want to get into some technical studies about all of that, by all means, go for it. I'm going to, to contest that we are to be filled by the, we're with the Spirit, and everything that comes after that is ways in which we are filled. The way that that flows out of us, the way that we live, how that is impacting our lives, what we're supposed to do as a result, this is what it looks like. This is what uh, being filled with the Spirit is. Um, and so there, there are going to be four, and I, technically there are five, I, I realize that, but there are four phrases led off with uh, participles. And I'm, what I'm saying is that these participles describe what it is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, and then question nine on the handout was, uh, list these verses, 19 through 21, list four participles as ways to be filled with the Spirit. What are they and how do we live those out? And I... Uh, just, just for your awareness, this is my answer to that. So I, I, I understand and I realize that's a big, broad question. And there's a lot involved in it. So I may not have left you enough space at the bottom of the page, but you can always write on the back of the page. Um, so what are these ways in which we are to uh, be filled with the Holy Spirit? What's that to look like? Well, the first give thanks for all things. Okay, give thanks is one of them. Thanks. Speaking in okay. psalms, hymns, and spiritual. Speaking, uh, the, the way that we speak, which we'll, we'll dig into all of these here in just a moment. That's two. Um, singing. Singing. 
and making melody. Giving. Yep. Uh, those are those are the two that I joined together. Yes. Singing and making melody because they are synonyms, and like I said, we'll we'll dig into those a little bit. And, and then, then there's one more. Then to be putting it into a participle form, be be subjecting, be subject okay. yourselves to one another. Yeah. Verse 21. And be subject or be subjecting uh, to one another in the fear of Christ. So there's there's four different phrases or four different things. Let's uh, let's start with the first one listed there. Speaking. What what is it to speak? I know it's real simple. Yeah. Do what? Just what we're doing. To talk, right? When when we talk, um, it's it's the things that we say. <clears throat> you should be in bear in mind the context of what we've just dealt with. Back in chapter four, verse twenty nine, uh, it says, "Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification, according to the need of the moment, that it may give grace to those who hear." So keep that in mind as we delve into, well, what is this speaking to yourselves or speaking to one another, depending on your translation, we'll get to deal with that in a moment. Uh, that, that idea of speaking, it's to, to conform to that, not unwholesome words, but what is edifying, what is building up. Um, also in chapter 5, verse 4, it said, and there must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving thanks. That's 5.4. And so the context and the, the ideas that he's been talking about deal with the way that we talk and the things that we say. But then, specifically, he's going to say, he's going to tell us how should we then be speaking or talking. Now, um, it was pointed out, and it's, it's a good observation, the, the word used here, speaking to... Technically, the word is to yourselves. Um, but you start looking at the way that, that's, that it's set up and what's going on, the idea is speaking amongst all y'all is. And so a lot of translations are going to say speaking to one another. The idea being within the body of Christ, within the church, we are talking to one another. We are speaking to ourselves, ourselves being Christians, fellow believers, in this way. Um, so there, there is a, a difference in translations, and that's kind of the reason why. Um, the, the conclusion is, how are we to be speaking, though? First of all, we are to be speaking uh, in psalms. What are psalms? Poems. Poems? Okay, psalms. Poems. Poems. When it's just outside of, of this, if I say the Psalms, what comes to mind? The, the Book of Psalms. Okay, thank you. The Old Testament, right? Scripture. Um, these these are primarily the Psalm book of the Old Testament. This is what the Jews were used to. That's what they sang out of. Um, that was part of how they they worshipped God and praised Him. We ought to be talking to one another, communicating to each other out of Scripture with these hymns, these psalms, sorry, um, these, these musical things from the Old Testament. So the first one is psalms, but what's the second one then? Hymns. hymns all right? This is uh, a song of praise, is what that means. And so there's, there's some debate and there's a lot of... If you want to read theological arguments and discussions, you can get into all kinds of them. Uh, this distinction that I personally would make between psalms and hymns is that the psalms are primarily the Old Testament book. Hymns are songs of praise that aren't necessarily scripture. The idea is still there that it's, it is um, musical praise towards God, but... I'm saying that I would, I would view it as using scripture and using modern hymns or non-scripture is the, the idea that's going on there. Um, well, yes, sir. Well, we do this Sunday morning. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes we sing songs that are straight from the text of the Bible. And sometimes we sing songs that take the concepts, bring them together, and are still praising God. And, and so in either of those, and in both of those, we are talking to one another in a way that elevates our, our mindset to consider who is God? What has He done? Why is He worthy of praise? 
That's the kind of things, if you go back to uh, verse 29 of chapter 4, that's not the unwholesome words. That's the, the words that accord to, or that are good for edification according to the need of the moment. That's what builds us up. That's what helps us to become more like Christ by reminding ourselves, both individually, me, myself, and ourselves, we corporately, what is it that the Bible says about God? Both straight from the text, like the Psalms, or in that uh, song of praise. But then there's, a, there's another one. It says spiritual songs. Um, and so these are, these are three different words um, that they're, they're somewhat synonyms. So there's a lot of similarities. There, there's a little bit of distinction between them. Um, the Psalms, like I said, is Old Testament. Hymns would be modern, uh, a song of praise. And then spiritual songs, um, the word itself implies the idea that it's poetic. And so it's not just um, uh, this, this expression statement, but a poetic, beautiful method in which we do so. Were you raising your hand? Well, I, I, when I, I saw that, I think of it as the songs that the songs that we sing, like "I love you, Lord," "I lift my voice to worship you," "Oh my mm -hmm. Lord, rejoice." Those those types of songs that you're that uh, it's uh, it's a spiritual thing. It's coming from you. It's speaking to God. It's maybe putting your prayer to words, uh, but putting it into into a melody or that type of thing where it's just you speaking it out but in some type of a, a song or melody okay uh, that I, that's the way I, I saw that the, the I mean like I said that all three of them they're very similar they're they are somewhat um, repetitive he's emphasizing this idea that we use a, a poetic musical method in which we encourage one another and encourage ourselves and build up in the faith towards Christ. Yes, ma'am. Didn't they do that a lot in the, in the Bible days? Mm -hmm. They did a lot of praising and singing. Yeah, I mean, that, tambourines and the, that's what the Book of yeah, Psalms yeah. is all about. Exactly. That's that's their hymnal, mm -hmm. and and I mean, you know, modern modern churches don't use the the printed hymnal nearly as much. Um, but I mean that's what it is, and so are these are these the songs that are going in your mind are regularly being reminded of the truth of Scripture and the the praise of God and the the ideas of what's going on. But notice where are these directed? These this section is not speaking to God. These things it's speaking to one another. And so this is the idea of edification, of building up. Um, I, I, here in a moment, we're going to see the next section is directed towards God, which I found fascinating because a little bit ago we saw the idea that we used to be at enmity. We used to be enemies with God and one another, right? Between Jews and Gentiles, there was a separation that Christ broke down. Between God and man, there was a separation that Christ broke down. And yet now, we are able to speak to one another in a way that is encouraging and developing and building up. And then, it, it goes on from there, uh, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, saying and making melody with your heart to the Lord. And so it has that same vertical and horizontal concept or idea that we saw back in, was that chapter chapter 2, I think? Yeah, uh, chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. Uh, he broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross by having put to death the enmity. Okay, I said verse 15, that's 14, 15, and 16. But, yes ma'am? Unity. Unity. Yeah. Exactly. And, and how, do we, how do we enhance that? How do we foster that? By the things that we say. Not in a way that breaks down, not in a way that insults, 
um, also not in a way that's filthy or silly or coarse, as we saw back in 5.4, but instead what is fitting and useful and uh, edifying. Those are the kinds of things that ought to be coming out of our mouth. Now, what does it mean to be singing and making melody? Technically, these are two separate participles, like I said, but they're linked together with, a, with an and, with a chi, mm-hmm. in a single phrase. So I, that's, that's why I said that they're one, even though, yeah, they're two, but yeah. So what is singing? Just the word itself. What does singing mean? Expressing through music. Uh... It means just that, to sing, to chant, to express through music. To, uh, it's, it's that word. Now, interestingly, in Scripture, that word is always used of praise to God. And so when we sing, we, we ought to be praising God. What about making melody? What is that? Do what? Music. Music. It's a synonym. It's basically the same thing. Um, singing and making mu- uh, melody. The ma- making melody is a word that comes from the vibration of musical instruments. So it's a means of making music. Again, this is used of praise towards God. So when we, when we sing, it's our voices. When we make melody, it's the music that we make. The way that we, you know, whether it's with instruments or, or whatever. Now, I find it interesting, this, this focus and this emphasis on music, poetry, the art form, the, the emotional response that comes of that. Have you ever uh, been aware of the impact that music makes on you, on your attitude, on your thoughts, on your, I mean, there's a reason that there's a thing called hype music when you're exercising, or, you know, fight songs when you're, or uh, think of like going to a, a football game or something, the kind of music that, you know, all of those things, that's what music does. And so here Paul's saying, hey, those things ought to be part of what builds you up. What, what edifies and draws you closer is how you praise God. It's how you encourage one another with those, those things. Now, does that mean that we should never use secular music? Something to think about. Well, it depends we could on have the kind of secular it. music you're listening to. No? Oh, it yeah. depends. Do, do what? No, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, the opinion of music is that, like, the more I realize, the more I see them, pretty much all. We, we've got to, we, if nothing else, I would contest we need to pay attention. Yeah. Think about it. There is what some. is it doing? Is it unwholesome? Is it filthy and silly and coarse? Yeah. Or is it edifying and fitting and giving of thanks? There is some beautiful music. There are some very beautiful uh, uh, secular music that is beautiful. Mm -hmm. But uh, but you have to know what it's saying. You have to understand what it's about. You know, you don't want to. I I remember as a as a teen was the um, contemporary Christian music and and music wars and I mean all kinds of and I I don't want to necessarily get into picking and choosing and defining, you know, this is and that isn't. And, but I think we should think about it. And within the context of what Paul's talking about here, is what we are listening to and singing building us up and drawing us closer to God, or is it drawing us away? And that's an important consideration. You yes, also got to be careful of just Christian music because a lot of it, like I just heard one doing post trip, mm. and then he made some statements that was incorrect. Yeah, exactly. Oh, there's. And so I'm just going, oh I man, I got to pay more attention to what you guys yeah. are saying. I think so. there's a lot of Christian music that yeah. isn't. I, yeah, I, I agree. No, I, I agree. So I, I, I don't want to. You know, over overly develop that one as much as just being aware. God views music as important and significant, and we ought to as well. Um, and and just automatically, we know the impact 
that it can have. And so being aware of that, we should, we should be cautious. We should be careful. Um, what, what then does verse 20 tell us? Always giving thanks for the nice, pleasant, good times, right? That's not what it says. Always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. Always giving thanks for all things. Um, there are a lot of parallel verses. Um, I, I wrote these down. I don't necessarily intend to take the time to go to all of them right now. But I would encourage you to jot these down and we can, you, you can take a look at them. Some of them will be very familiar. Like 1 Thessalonians 5.18. That's, that's part of the uh, rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God. This is you know, one of those things. That's 1, Corinthians, or sorry, 1 Thessalonians 5.18. Um, and then 2 Thessalonians 1.3, uh, Colossians 3.17, and Philippians 1.3-6. And I do want to turn to that one and read it. What was that, Colossians? Colossians 3.17. Okay. Uh, Philippians 1.3-6. Okay. Colossians 3.17, well, Colossians and Ephesians are very parallel. There's a lot of themes and ideas that are repeated in both of those. Um, and so, yeah, 3.17 is one of those. But Philippians 1, verses 3-6, through 6, it says, I thank my God in all my remembrances of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all, in view of your participation in the Gospel from the first day until now. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. And so, I, I make note of that because Paul, he's, he's not just saying, I'm thankful for you, and then moves on. He gets very specific about what he's giving thanks for. And, I mean, he did the same thing at the beginning of Ephesians as well. Um, at least I thought he did. But he, he emphasizes, if, if you watch the prayers of Paul, he's very specific in them. And in, in Philippians 1, he said, hey, I'm thankful to God when, I, when I'm reminded of you and I pray for you, uh, particularly in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now, for I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it, until the day of Christ Jesus. And so Paul is thankful for people, for other Christians. He's thankful for the church. He's, he's expressing this gratitude. Um, and those are, those are things that we ought to be giving thanks for. But then, as we already mentioned, giving thanks for all things, that includes the not so pleasant. We still ought to be giving thanks for those. Um, so always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. So we are to, to give thanks in the name of the Lord to God. And that's, that's who we're giving thanks to. Now I, I made a, uh, just a little side note on this. Here a couple of weeks ago at men's group, we were talking about something called the Granville Sharps Rule, uh, which if you've not heard of it, don't worry too much, but it's a way that you understand how the Greek is written. And the, the point or the emphasis is that this is one of those where it, it tells us God is the Father. And, and we are thankful to God who is the Father. Or the, the NASB says even the Father. Those two are connected. Um, you, you can't separate and say, well, I'm giving thanks to God. I'm also giving thanks to the Father, two separate people, but one in the same. And that's a, like I said, it came up during a, a men's Sunday night thing, and I thought it was, was worth pointing out. Here's another good example of it. Um, and then what's the, what's the fourth one? What's the last participle in this, in this section that tells us what it is to be filled with the Spirit? To be subjecting yourselves to one another. Okay. 
And, and I, I like what you've done. You've kind of rephrased it in a way to, to keep that participle feel and vibe to it. Um, the, the idea is to be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Now, when I initially wrote this, I didn't have you dig into what is to be subject. In the next section, we definitely do dig into that quite a bit because it, that's going to become a major, major theme and point and, and idea. So let's, let's go ahead here and talk about what is it to be subject? What does that mean? What's that? Submitting. That Submitting. Okay. Put yourself under. To okay. To place under. Any, any others? Subordinate to? Okay. Is it, is so, it, is it a military term, maybe? So the term itself is, is used in the military, uh, in the, the Roman army. The idea is to be in proper order under the authority of the commander. And so if you've ever looked at the military, when, they, when everybody is in formation, everybody lines up, right? And it's, it's not just a single line, but you, you get everybody in the right order and lined up so that as a unit, they are able to do what was necessary. And if each person said, well, I'm going to go this way and you're going to go that way and we're, we're just going to do our own, that does not work well. One of, one of the things about the, the Roman legions and their, their military was the fact that they had good discipline, they had good drill and order, they would stand in formation protecting one another with their shields. And um, the phalanx, is, it's just a, a massive military method. And that's what this word is dealing with, that idea of subjecting. They put themselves under the authority of the commander of their unit so that they could accomplish what that unit was supposed to do, what it was designed to do. So when, when we are told here in verse 21, be subject to one another in the fear of Christ, what is that talking about? What, what is expected of us? What are we supposed to do? I think we're supposed to be concerned for, those, for each other. We're supposed to be, be there to support one another. We're supposed to be there to work you know, we're talking about in Ephesians, we're all to be one part of the uh, one part of the whole. There you go. You know, we've, we've got, we're told that we have to do our part to make it work. The, the example that Paul has been using throughout the book is this idea of a body, of a unified body. And yet, each part has its role to play. Each has its position to play within that. And here in a little bit, um, over the rest of chapter 5 and into chapter 6, we're going to find some specifics of what those roles are and how that's supposed to function. Right here, he's starting off that section with the idea, be subject to one another. Now, submitting to one another or um, that idea of subjection is to set under, to put yourself under one another, elevating them above your own interests. And I, I really like the idea of it is to place beneath. And so that, that can be viewed as to be crushed under or to be the foundation of, to lift up, to build up. And we've just been talking about this idea of edifying one another, which is to build up, to strengthen, to assist. So the, the idea that I would encourage you to be aware of or to think about if we are to be filled with the Spirit and be subjecting ourselves under one another, fitting within the context, that's not something that, that they are lording over me and pushing me down. That's I am placing myself under to lift up, to elevate, to assist, is the, the idea that's being presented here. And I, um, I think that one other thing with that is that we're in a we are in a society so often that competes. Mm -hmm. We are not in competition with one another. No, no, we are not each all. doing our part. We each have our part, and it's got to work harmoniously together. Yeah. So there's not a competition to put someone else down or to want a better thing than what God gave you or whatever. You do you work where He gives you the place to work. Yeah, and so so we are not to put ourselves over and stamp somebody down. 
we to place ourselves under. Um, and, and yeah, doing our doing our part, fitting into the, the process that God intended. Um, this this is used of an idea of to be a servant to. Um, it comes up in Titus chapter two, verse nine, and First Peter chapter two, verse eighteen. That's Titus two nine, and First Peter two eighteen. As the the example of of in the military, I think is very useful for this because as fellow military warriors, we align for battle in proper order. And so this idea of being subject to one another is that we line up with and, and alongside of and behind and, and order ourselves so that we can accomplish what the commander has in store, what the, what the military plan is. So it's used of the idea of to be a servant to one another, um, but not just as servants. Uh, and, and what's really neat and interesting in this is it's very countercultural, even as, as Linda pointed out. In our world today, it's me first. I'm getting on top, I'm doing whatever is necessary, and I'll step on whoever I have to to get there. That, that's the general mindset of the world. I'm looking out for number one. Yep. Looking out for number one. And yet, what Paul is telling these believers in all of this, to be filled with the Spirit, is to be countercultural, to be different than what everybody else is doing. Instead, to put ourselves under so that we can uh, accomplish what He wants. This really came up in Mark chapter 10. I want to I want to go ahead and take a look at that one as well. Uh, in Mark chapter ten, verses forty-two through forty-five. Mark chapter ten, verses forty-two through forty-five. Now, you got to catch the context in this. Um, Where's that? James, uh, James, and John, the two sons of Zebedee came up to him saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever he asked. This is verse 35 of Mark chapter 10. He says, What do you want? Uh, Grant that we may sit in your glory, one on your right hand, one on your left. Okay, so that's the context of what's going on. You, you recall this, this account, right? Where James and John, they, they want to be elevated. They want the positions of authority and power and such. Uh, Initially, Jesus says, you, uh, you don't know what you're asking for. Uh, are you even able to handle this? But then we get down to um, verse, did I say 42? Verse 42. Um, so 41, the, the ten begin to feel indignant with James and John. 42, calling them to himself, Jesus said to them, you know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give His life a ransom for many. So this idea that we are to subject ourselves or be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Christ Himself did that. Uh, um, Philippians 2 is, is full of that concept. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. That He, he gave up His rightful position and instead lowered Himself and took on the form of a man. And, and all of that is what is, is being presented and taught here in verse 21 of Ephesians chapter 5, that we are to do to one another. So how can we do that? How can we, we live in such a way that we place ourselves under, that rather than trying to be on top, that we're to be viewing ourselves in such a way to build them up? Well, I think the next section kind of deals with that a little bit. And uh, this next section... Oh, I got I got hands up. So before we move on, go ahead. But the but but, but the end of that verse twenty one is um, in the fear of the Lord, mm -hmm. and so that makes all the difference in the world. Is that you're putting God first. He's in command. Uh, 
and it tells you to help your fellow brethren or whatever, you're going to go do it. Okay. You, have, you have the fear of the Lord. You have the awe. Yeah, that, that idea of, of in the fear of the Lord, um, you know, it's, it's out of respect and reverence and awe of Him. It's not that I'm, I'm subject, subject to someone else because I'm scared of them. It's because of my view of God that leads to this. Yeah. Did you have... I, I can't help but wonder if our numbering system here is another one of those disservices to the, the meaning that really 21 flows right into 22 and mm-hmm. on. So, yeah. yes. There is not a hard break here. Um, in fact, if, you, if you've got uh, the next section, go ahead and pull that out. The very first question that I ask is, what is the controlling verb of verse 22? So I'm, I'll read 22 um, and then ask you that question. Now, in most translations, it says, wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. This is one of those verses that gets um, a bad rap. I'll, I'll admit. Yes. Yes. I'm not a tyrant. Huh? Do what? He said he's not a tyrant. Not a tyrant. Well, <laughs> I think that this is one of those that gets a bad rap. And I hope that by the time we finish, you will have a, a good understanding of the beauty and the power of Christ in what he says and what he expresses in this upcoming section. Did you have something? I was just going to ask you a question. Okay. What, what's the controlling verb here? The controlling verb is the one that's missing, and it's uh, this be subject or submit. Yep. And you got to take it out of verse 21, I think. Yep. So this verse, verse 22, does not have its own verb. Do what? I didn't hear what you didn't hear what he said. No. He, he said it's uh, it's the one that's missing, and you have to go back to 21 to get it. The verse 22 does not have its own verb, which is why what you're saying about this this division not being there, you're right. And so even though I had the break point right here, I'm I'm really glad that it worked out that we didn't stop at verse 21 and then continue separately into 22 because this continues as a as a straight flow you have to go all the way back to verse 18 to pick up a primary verb a command and that's be filled with the spirit be filled by the spirit by or or in this way speaking singing uh, giving thanks being subject specifically You wives, be subject. You're subject to one another in the fear of Christ, but specifically you wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. And so the the instruction here is, here's how the wives fulfill this command of be filled with the Holy Spirit. Or be, be filled with the Spirit as compared to being drunk with wine. So so we go all the way back to that to pick up the context of what's going on. We are not to be drunk with wine. We're not to be under the control of wine. We're not to be giving ourselves to wine because that's pointless. It's useless. Instead, we are to be filled with the Spirit. We're to be controlled by the Spirit. We're to be under His authority, under His control, doing what He wants. We're to do that in these ways that we just looked at, we get down to this last one, being subject to one another, that command is given to everyone. That instruction is given to everybody within the body of Christ. That that each of us is to view others as better than ourselves, as greater than ourselves, as more valuable than ourselves. We're to place ourselves under them. Now let's specify this. Let's dig in and how does that work? What does that look like? And that's what Paul's doing in this next section. He's saying, wives, here's how you do that. You do that by being subject to your own husbands. Which means you're, you're, as a wife, your focus is not to subject yourselves to anybody and everybody in the church. Your, your goal, your focus, is how do I do this to my own husband? 
I do it to my husband as to the Lord. Why? Is it because he's a tyrant and he's in charge? Is it because I'm worthless and pointless and, and women are of no value? No! For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ also is the head of the church. So we're going to be shifting our focus. We're going to be, be looking at this. I, I already mentioned this whole idea is countercultural, and yet when we get into this, we're going to find that it is vastly countercultural. <laughs> It's not just slightly different. It is way, way different. So if you've got uh, the, the handouts, whether you already had it and read through it or you just got it this evening, go ahead and pull those out. And I, I made a note at the start of this. I said, notice that there are very few imperative verbs. Mm -hmm. the, those are command verbs. In the last section and the section before that, there were lots of instructions. <coughs> do this, do this, do this. They were commands. They were imperatives. In this section, there are going to be a bunch of subjunctives, which, for those of you who like to nerd out on the Greek, a subjunctive is a verb of possible or potential future. It often expresses a desired action or outcome. The idea is this is what ought to be. So I'm not telling you, you must do this. I'm saying you ought to. This, this is what it ought to look like. Now. Subjunctives, you start digging into it, and it's, it's one of those uh, Greek verb forms that can be kind of uh, crazy and, I mean, all kinds of stuff going on, um, and, and used for a lot of different things. So I'm oversimplifying it, and I realize that. So take this with everything else you know about Greek. But I like the example of uh, when I was in the military, you could get orders, right? And, and if a commander, if an officer came up to you and said, Sergeant Jack, you do this. You know what Sergeant Jack did? Exactly what he was told. Because it was a command. Failure to follow that is a big problem. If I had a senior NCO or, or even an officer come up, you know, Sergeant Jack, it sure would be nice if you would. Did he command me? Technically, no. But you know what? If your commander comes up and makes a suggestion like that, it's a really good idea to do it. That's what he's doing here. That's what Paul's doing here. He, he is presenting this in a, a subjunctive form, a, a possible potential future of what it ought to be. If you're a believer, you ought to be a certain way. You ought to do these things. Paul is, is shifting the way that he's presenting this. In the, in the last little bit, we were commanded, be imitators of God, walk in love, do not let immorality, impurity, or greed even be named among you. Um, and, and the list goes on. There's, there were a bunch of those imperatives, those commands throughout chapter 5. He's shifting it up a little bit here to present, hey, if you're a believer, of course you want to be filled with the Spirit, right? I mean, that, that's what it is to be a believer. So that means you ought to do what follows. Now, I, I mention that because as we go through uh, this first part that's dealing with, with the wives, you're going to see that subjunctive used quite a bit in relation to wives and, and what is going on there. But you're also going to see that in regards to the husband. But there is a command in there as well. So we're, we're going to get to all of that here in a little bit. Uh, the first question was, what is the controlling verb of verse 22? It is that uh, be subject back in verse 21. Um, and that is a participle, which structurally, this is all tied back to that be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit, everybody, every believer is to be filled with the Spirit. Every believer is to be subject to one another. Now, specifically, wives to your own husbands. That means that, that wives are not to be subject just to anybody and everybody, but specifically to their husbands as to the Lord. Well, what if my husband's a jerk? Does it, does it say anything about that? No. It says, wives, be subject to your husband. 
So what does it mean to be subject? To arrange under, to place yourself under. Now, one thing that I, I like to emphasize in this is the husband commanded to make your wife be subject to you? He's not in there. So, so pay attention to who is told what. But beyond that, pay attention to why. Verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife. This is another of those, you start reading theology books and there's going to be all kinds of nonsense and craziness out there. The, the idea of head is chief or lord. Um, it is a, a level of authority. It is a level of, of supremacy or, or um, being in charge. That is what's being presented with the idea of head. Um, <clears throat> yes? I looked up that word for and it means since or because. Yes. Yeah. So and it's, 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 it's pretty strongly that way. Yeah. And it, it's, it's tying it right back. The reason that we do this is not because, um, you know, it's not for any other reason. It's because the husband is head of the wife as, in the same way, that Christ is the head of the church. So this, this comparison is being made. And I even asked that question, what comparison is made in verse 23? It's, that's the comparison, the husband to the wife, Christ to the church. And so this is, this is going to come up. And I think that the biggest point in the whole section, and I was, I was trying to figure out, okay, when's, when's the time to really get to this? I think going into it, it's important to, to be aware of. The biggest point of this whole section is what's being instructed reflects Christ. So do you, as a, as a Christian, as a follower of Christ, do you want to display Christ to others? Well, how do you do that? Wives, by being subject to your own husbands. Because, or since, or for the reason, the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ also is the head of the church, then he's, he's going to insert a theological concept. He himself, that's Christ, being the Savior of the body. Christ is the Savior. He is the head. He's the, the supreme. He's the one in, in charge. He's the authority. So, as the uh, verse 24, as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands. And that's, that's where that um, subjunctive idea... He, he could write it, so also wives obey your husbands. That's not what it says. He could write it, wives defer in everything or, or be trampled on by or, or all of those, those ideas and theories that people throw out of, oh, well, I, they're, they're, this is just... That's not what it says. What it, what it says is so also ought the wives to be to their husbands in everything because that's going to display Christ to the world. I go back to that question, well, what if my husband's a jerk? What if, what if, what if, what if? Or if he's not a Christian. How can, it, even that, can the way that you place yourself, this to the wives, the way that you place yourself under his authority, even though he's not a great guy, does that display Christ to others? Can that? There's another verse I didn't look it up, but uh, you can, wives can win them without a word. Mm -hmm. And that idea is, is I think it's Peter. Uh, it's, I want to say Peter. Win them without a word. Where's that? Peter. You saw it's Peter. I think it's uh, along about First Peter. Five. I tried to find it. I couldn't find it. I was looking in the wrong Three. Place. Three. 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 Uh, probably going to be... Th Yep, First uh, Peter chapter three verse one. In the same way, you wives be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives. Three one. First Peter three one. First Peter three one. Now, is that easy? Is that simple? No. No. I don't. I don't want to oversimplify this, and, and this is one that can get really difficult, and you know there, there are a lot of 
terrible examples. And so there's, there's a lot involved in that as well. I'm not denying that. Um, but the idea here is that wives, by placing themselves, voluntarily placing themselves under the authority, lining up in a way to elevate their husbands, shows who Christ is. It displays that Christ is the head of the church, just like they are allowing the husband to be the head of their wife. That's, that's what um, 22 through 24 is all about, is, is this idea of reflecting and displaying and showing Christ. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church. He himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be to their own husbands in everything. Do we give thanks in the good times and the bad times? Wives, do you position yourselves in, in line like the military idea or in subjection, lifting up, being under in the good times and the bad times? That's tough. That's hard. I, but it doesn't end there. Oh, go ahead. I, I think so often, uh, it, and you say it's a cultural thing. We, we said that, that it's really against what our culture is. Yeah. Is that if we look at marriage as what God meant it to be, that when you become one flesh, you know, that if you can take that and understand whatever you're doing by submitting and then your husband loving you through that submission and all of that, it, it's because you are one. You, you shouldn't ha get married and have these two diverse lives that you're going to be living out there and think that that isn't cre going to create a problem. Yeah. You, you've got to come to get, not that the wife can't have her things that she does and whatever, but you support each other in it because you are one flesh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and as long as, I think as, I think sometimes <coughs> we don't, we don't press that enough in marriage and I don't know what pastors do to talk about marriage counseling with people before they marry them and all that kind of thing. But I, I think that sometimes that isn't stressed so that they think that they can just go, our culture is that she can have her wonderful life over here and he can have his, and everything is going to be hunky dory. Well, it's not. Mm -hmm. Because well, problems, but once you are together in your thinking that you're working together in everything that you do, that changes a lot of things. And, and that's what the, the rest of the section is really going to develop further. And yeah, when it, when it comes to premarital, premarital counseling, that's something, unfortunately, a lot, a lot of people don't get. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people don't get nearly enough for what they ought to or, or anything else. Um, but understanding these, these roles that are God's design, what he, what he created, what he intended. And uh, here in a little bit, Paul is even going to bring out Genesis from the very beginning. But he's also started off here as Christ is the head of the church. And so there's a lot of theological ideas and concepts coming out of this, which results in it being completely countercultural, completely different. Which means, but before we get into the next section, when, with that premarital counseling idea, wives... If you look at the guy that you're, that you're thinking about getting married to, and you're like, well, I, I don't know that I could do that, you might need to be thinking again. Just going to throw that out there. But if you're already married, this is the instruction. This is what it ought to be. Now, are, are there sometimes some, some dumb husbands that cause problems? No doubt. Oh. But that doesn't, that's not an escape clause. That's not a, oh, I get out of it just because my husband's... And that's, that's what uh, 1 Peter 3, 1 was, was talking about. Mm -hmm. that, that you are to be submissive. And, and this is another of those words. I, I spent the time developing that idea of, of putting yourself under or placing yourself in proper order with because our world thinks of submissive the same way that it thinks of meekness. Oh, well, that's, that's weak and that's trampled on and that's a, a nobody. Not at all. Not at all. 
the idea is that, that the wife voluntarily places herself under the authority of her husband so that she can display to the world how Christ is the head of the church. And, and wives, if you view it that way, like, hey, I am telling everybody who Jesus is by the way that I am voluntarily placing myself under the authority of my husband. What a difference that makes. Mm -hmm. Completely countercultural. Completely different than, than what others would see. But that's what we read back in Mark chapter uh, 10 as well. That, hey guys, you, we're not like the world. We don't do things their way. You want to be first? You've got to place yourself under. Like I said, it doesn't end there. Verse 25. Husbands. Now here, this is not a subjunctive. This is a flat out command. Husbands, love your wives. Period. Exclamation, exclamation. However, whatever. What is commanded? What is, what is it to love? Twenty-five. Yep. Uh, the God, the God, the verse seven. or not verse? Uh, question number seven is where we're at. Because um, question number six was to whom is the church to be subject? In verse twenty-four, obviously that's Christ. Uh, question number seven: What is the first verb in verse twenty-five? And parse it. Um, which I I kind of already told you. This is love. It's it is agape. Um, which Agapeo. we've discussed extensively, agapeo. Yeah. You're, you're probably pronouncing the, uh, the full word yeah, correctly. Like 25, but, yeah, 25, not 26. Yeah, that's, that's the verb. Okay. Yeah, it's the verb problem. of the, uh -huh. those, uh, there are several right there together. 20, I think it's 24, 25, 26 are all um, the same root. The point being, that's the kind of love that we're talking about. And, and that's one of the cool things about the Greek. There are multiple words used for love. Which one is used here? The, the kind of love that God gives to us, which we're going to develop here in a moment. Uh, I said parse it. It's a present active imperative. Second person plural. What does that mean? <laughs> present. Be doing it. Be doing it. Active. Do it. Doing. Not receive. Not the, the, this is this is one of those. We're we're gonna side note just for a minute on on parsing a verb. Present is do it. The, like all the time. Not not in the past. Not in the future. But right now, right. wherever you are at all times, be constantly. Uh, active is you're the one engaged in doing it. You're not receiving it. So this idea of husbands, it, it's not husbands be loved by your wives. It's husbands, you love your wife. Imperative, it's a command. Do it. Not if you feel like it, or maybe every now and then, or if, 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 if. There, there are no ifs. Husbands, love your wife. It's, uh, and the second person, plural, is um, that it's being told to someone else and it's all husbands. So husband, if you have a wife, you are commanded to love her. Is, I, I mentioned with the, the wives, wives to your own husbands, does this have an escape clause? Well, my husband's a jerk and he's an idiot and he doesn't make wise choices. Doesn't matter, you submit. Husbands, what if your wife is any of those? <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't matter. Love her anyway. In fact, love her how? Just as Christ also loved the church. Mm -hmm. Guys, keep going. This is heavy. And gave himself. Uh, this, this, well, yeah, I'm, I'm going to keep going. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. But, but guys, this is not a lightweight. Oh, it feels good. She's so pretty, and I just love her so much. No. You start reading this. You start digging into this. You start living this out. This is serious. Mm -hmm. This is hard. Mm -hmm. Love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself up for her. Mm -hmm. How did Christ do that? Mm -hmm. Christ died. Mm -hmm. He gave up. Go back to, to Philippians chapter 2. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus who, though He was in the form of God, did not find that something to be grasped 
can't quote the whole thing correctly. Let me read it. Philippians 2. Verse 5, starting off in verse 5. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, being found, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Husbands, how much do you love your wife? This isn't easy. I, I, this isn't lightweight. This is completely countercultural. Just like the idea that the wife is to submit to the husband, the husband is to love her. That's, that's I would contest even more than submitting, mm-hmm. because it's not placing yourself under her authority by any means. It's saying, I don't matter. My wants, my needs, my desires, my everything is nothing. I exist to take care of her. To love her for her best interest. That doesn't mean to make her happy. That means to take care of her. We do that to such an extent just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Guys, if you don't step back and be like, you got to read this. And, And we're just barely getting into it. Um, we're, we're coming up on time. But I'm, I'm going to keep reading and then we'll, we will come back and, and pick it up at this idea of husbands love your wives. But Paul is going to then get into some theological ideas. This, this idea that Christ loved the church and gave himself up for the church so that he might sanctify the church, sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with, with the word. There's a lot of theological power in that that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. That's Christ's goal in connection with the church, to sanctify her, to build her up, to make her pure and holy. This idea that he gave himself, that he loved the church so much that he died for her, the death of of Christ on the cross is what leads to and gives that ability of sanctification. We'll, we'll deal with all of that when we get back to it. So husbands ought also to love their wives. Guys, the way that we love our wives displays to the world who Christ is. And that's, that's Paul's point all through this. Whether she's a great, godly, wonderful, amazing woman, or she is the complete opposite of that. Husbands, love your wives. So also ought husbands to love their own wives as their body. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. Then he'll he'll get into that uh, Genesis chapter 2 information. He expresses, hey, this is a great mystery. Uh, And then he will conclude it out in verse 33. We will come back and we'll, we will pick up uh, this section next week and, and really dig in. If, if you get nothing else, and I, I would encourage you read it, study it. You've got the handout now. Make sure you, you dig into it. If you notice nothing else, all of this section is about reflecting Christ to the world. The way that wives interact with their husbands, the way that husbands interact with their wives. It is all designed to reflect Christ to the world. And all of that is then tied back structurally to what we just dealt with of be filled with the Spirit. Subject yourselves one to another in the fear of Christ. All of this is tied back to that. So if you are a follower of Christ, this is what it looks like. That's why that subjunctive keeps coming up. This is what it ought to be if you are being filled with the Spirit. And that's what believers should be filled with the Spirit. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, sometimes we, we get into things that are not easy. They're not simple. 
Lord, You know each of our situations. You know each of our hearts. You know our, our past and our present and our futures. You know all things. And Lord, I know that, that there have been all kinds of issues and challenges and, and problems and, and things that people face. And ultimately, it's the result of sin, sin in ourselves, sin in others. And yet, what You have called us to, what You expect of us, it's completely countercultural, completely different from the ways of the world. And yet, it gives us an opportunity to display Christ to the world around us. So Lord, for those who are in situations where, that make this very difficult, I pray that You would strengthen them. Open their eyes to Your love for us. Your desire for us. Your best. And Lord, I pray that You would help each of us, all of us, to recognize that in the way that we interact with our spouse, we are able to show the world who You are and what You've done. What an amazing testimony that can be to have a godly husband and a godly wife working together to accomplish Your will. So Lord, we love You. We praise You. We thank You for all that You do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.